I invite you this morning to open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, John chapter 10 and verses 1 through 11. John chapter 10, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 11. When I came in this morning, the choir was practicing, and they practiced about two hours or an hour and a half. I appreciate our choir and music team, I tell you. Because that, that version of the Star Spangled Banner required a lot, an awful lot. Well, today it is Memorial Day and the weekend, and oftentimes we do not fully remember what Memorial Day is for. It is not for the kickoff of summer, although there are many on summer vacations already or taking a long weekend. I'm missing dozens of our own people today. It's not about the cookouts, but it's really about the men and the women who have sacrificed their all for our freedom. The scripture says it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Jesus Christ sacrificed his all for our freedom. He sacrificed his all that we might follow after him in fullness and in truth, that we might know him and make him known. And today I want us to talk about the source of our life in Christ Jesus, but I also want to point out to you a couple of things that are important to know and to understand and to remember in that process. In John chapter 10, the very first verse declares, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he was brought out all, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, and, and, and the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and may have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We're in a series of sermons called Follow Me. The Lord Jesus declared, if any man desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So we've been talking about the implications of following Christ. As a matter of fact, we've talked about, you know, how that faith comes in our lives. We've talked about how our faith grows from no faith to little faith to great faith and possibly to amazing faith. We've navigated through some storms and after every storm, there's always a mess to clean up. And we've talked about getting around in that mess and navigating that mess as well. And so today, I want, to, I want to further that talk. You know, we've talked about that disciple as that person who is a learner, a follower of Jesus Christ. We've talked about how that person's got to have faith, and we've talked about how Christ enables us and calls us to reach, to reach perfection, to reach completion in Him. You know, being a disciple is somewhat like being in the United States military. You ever think about that? You know, we have our five branches of the service. we got the Marines. Any Marines out here? we got the Army. We've got the Navy. We got the Air Force. Amen. We got the Coast Guard. Okay? 
And, you know, when, when you get ready to go off to basic training, you're at the uh, recruiting center, and you raise your right hand and you swear an oath. Right? And you begin an indoctrination process. You get to basic training, and I don't know what it was like from you guys, but I remember, you know, when that bus picked us up at the San Antonio, at San Antonio Airport and took us to Lackland, and the TI got on, and he's yelling and screaming, and I didn't even know we had done anything. I was thinking, what have I gotten myself into this time? And you begin that process of identification. And you go through basic and you've got classroom. You study about the uniform code of military justice. You, you march. You run. You do sit-ups and push-ups. You fold your underwear in triplicate form exactly six inches wide. You take on that identification, and when you finish basic training, it's then that you are a Marine, or a sailor, or a soldier, or a Coast Guardsman, or an Airman. And you identify. You might even get your picture made in front of an American flag to send home to your mama. But you identify. And for the rest of your life, you'll identify with that branch of service in which you served your country. When you became a follower of Jesus Christ, you began an identification process. You're what the Greek word calls a methetes, a disciple, a learner, a follower. You're walking in faith. You're, you're wanting to, to reach completion. You're wanting to reach perfection. You're wanting to be all that, that God has called you to be. And in this process, your faith has grown, you've gone through some storms, you've navigated the mess, things are happening, and the Lord Jesus begins to talk to us in a deeper sense about what life is. And you know, when you think about life, it, it's kind of all entailing. I mean, there's various forms of life, you know, and, and he says, I have come that they might have life, and might have that life abundantly. Well, he didn't come to give you just simply vegetable life. I mean, anybody can be a cauliflower, right? You know, my two oldest, bro my oldest brother and sister, they were born in the hospital where Cabbage Patch Babies are now born in Cleveland, Georgia. Y'all all remember Cabbage Patch Babies? That was a legitimate hospital, and that's where they were born. They were the original Cabbage Patch Babies, vegetable life. Right? But God didn't call, Jesus didn't come to just call us to be vegetables. As a matter of fact, He didn't call us to have just animal life. I mean, you know, dogs and cats can, can do some neat tricks maybe, and, you know, uh, the, the killer whale shows and all that kind of stuff. But God called you to, and to give you more than just the ability to do a, a neat trick. In human life, I mean, human life surrounds us. And... He's called us to more than that. He's called us to spiritual life. And spiritual life is a life that is qualitatively greater than the sum of the previous three that were mentioned. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have that life abundantly. And so here the Lord Jesus is declaring himself to be the source of a new kind of life. The source of a, of a new kind of life. In Him and in Him alone is found this thing called abundant life. Now, when you think about that, there are three important things that we need to understand about this abundant life and the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. And the first thing that we need to understand about that is that there are enemies to that life. There are enemies to that life. There are the Davy Downers to that life. You know, they, they don't want you to enjoy that life, to have that life. Yet Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and may have that life abundantly. He identifies those enemies as thieves, as robbers, as strangers and as hirelings, all mentioned in this opening paragraph. You know, there are those that, that preach a, a, 
and, and they hold back that more abundant life from their listeners. Last night I met with a young man that I'd not seen since he was eight years old. He was a kid in my little church that I pastored up in Ball Ground, Georgia. And we met and had conversation, and uh, Pastor Dan joined me, and, and my son Chris joined me. He's planting a church in New Orleans. You know, I, I look back and I think, you know, wow, that, that's pretty cool that God used some kid out of that church to go to New Orleans to plant a church in the Bywater, I think it's called. Is that right, Ralph? By, what did he say, Dan? Bywater? Bywater. Okay, the Bywater. And, and talking about the, the eclectic mixture of people and, and the mindset, you know, of no Christianity and all these kinds of things. And, and you know, so I was just kind of amazed and listening to him and, and, uh, and such. But we were talking, you know, we, we chatted a little bit about that area of North Georgia that I pastored in. And I served the only full-time church in the north end of the county. Uh, and all the other churches, what we call half-time churches, that meant they met twice a month or quarter time, they met once a month, you know, one Sunday out of four. That's the four, the quarter time. Okay? And, um, and we chatted about, you know, the, the very message that was proclaimed. And one of the messages that's there proclaimed is that in order for a person to get saved, you have to go to the altar. That's a little strange, isn't it? That you've got to go to the altar to get saved? But it's not just going to the altar, but it's begging and it's pleading with God to, to, to save you. And sometimes... You know, those people spend hours. Sometimes they'll spend days in revival back begging and pleading. That's a, that's a false gospel. That's a false gospel. But at the very same time, there's other false gospels that are being preached every day. In some churches, it's what we call the prosperity gospel. You know, if you'll give God your money, God's going to pour all His money back on you. The Bible says, bring the tithe into the storehouse and I'll open up the windows of heaven in your life. I agree, that's what it says, but the interpretation is, is God gives us things that are far greater than money. Money's just paper with ink on it. God gives us things that are far, far greater. There's false gospels that refuse to speak to the issue of our sin. You know, the Bible tells us all sin and comes short of the glory of God. That means everybody that's ever lived, that ever walked upon the planet of the earth, is a sinner. And the Bible tells us that the wages of that sin, for everybody who ever lived that walked upon the face of the earth who is a sinner, that the wages of that sin is death. Eternal separation from God in a place that burns with fire and brimstone called hell. But some people don't want to mention, oh, don't say hell, don't say fire and brimstone, don't talk about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, but that is a false gospel. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is about the, the God of heaven who sent his only begotten son to come to this planet and give the ultimate sacrifice, not that we might have a memorial over him, but that we might have a celebration because the grave could not hold him, and he came to set us free. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And he says, the one who doesn't enter by the, by the sheepfold's, sheepfold door but by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Jesus came right onto the scene. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he will go out in and out and he'll find pasture. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is declaring that he alone is the narrow way to heaven, and to the presence of God for eternity. There's not any other way. You know, people look for other ways to do things along the way. And, and so, you know, that, that enemy comes. And that enemy's method is a, is a deceptive method. In the book of Acts, we, we have um, Philip, the evangelist. He's doing a revival in the city of Samaria. And the Bible says that the people are paying close attention and they're listening. And it talks about a man there by the name of Simon who was a, war, who was a sorcerer. He was a magician. And his magic wasn't working too good since Philip came to, uh, to preach. 
And when the church in Jerusalem hears about it, they send out Peter and John to go check out and see what's going on in Samaria. And, and, and they perform signs and wonders. And Simon comes and says, hey, I want to buy this. Well, the deception is, is that the gospel cannot be bought. The gospel's been paid by Christ in full. The enemy not only has a deceptive uh, method, he has a defective message. The scripture says, a stranger they will not follow, they'll flee from. You know, our voice articulates our identity. Did you know that? Yesterday morning, I was up before anybody else, and I decided, well, I'll go ahead and vacuum the pool. And I was outside vacuuming the pool, and, you know, through the process, um, my granddaughter Zoe woke up, and her and that beloved dog Nene come out the door. And, and Nene is a, um, is a pug, and it's so smart, I can't stand it. You know, you try to get it to you, and it runs, I don't, I don't know. But, and I said, we're never having another dog after our last dog had died. And they bring it in anyway. But regardless, the dog didn't recognize who that was on the backside of the pool. And so, you know, I, the protective dog that it is ran behind Zoe. I stomped towards it and it went around the corner of the house. Because you see, it didn't recognize me. But the minute I spoke, here it came running. It was glad. My voice articulated my identity. And you see, the voice then articulates who we follow. You know, today there are a lot of voices, and many of these voices are, are you know, they've got a great amount of truth in them. But they're interlaced with just a little bit of falsehood. And you know what? Any truth that has any mixture of falsehood in it becomes an untruth. I mean, you know, you may like chocolate milk. And you know it's 99% pure and only 1% arsenic. I don't want that chocolate milk. You know, I don't want to touch it. Or maybe you like pizza, and you got a pizza, and there's eight pieces, and only one piece has arsenic on it. Which one? You see, it's important then that we know God's Word, and, 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 and any word that has a defect in it, an untruth, just a little bit, becomes fully defective. Today we live in, the, in a world of, of the voices of, of liberalism, where anything and everything goes. We live in a time of, of humanism that says it's all about you. You know, humanism's been coming around ever since the fall of man in the garden, thinking it's all about us. I mean, that's how Eve got tempted. You know, it's really God doesn't want you to be like Him, Eve. For in the day you do that, you'll know everything. You'll be like God. See, it was about them. And and so, you know, this is what we need to understand about these enemies of the gospel. Enemies of the gospel, they never give. They always take. Enemies of the gospel, they never bring to life. They only deaden. Enemies of the gospel, they never bless. They, They damn. They kill, they steal, and they destroy. And the word from the Greek, that word destroy, it means to be utterly Destroyed. Utterly destroyed. You know, I see pictures from where ISIS has been fighting and blowing up cities and everything else. Those places are utterly destroyed. Uninhabitable. So that's the first thing you need to know about this life. There's enemies to this life that God wants you to have. But the second thing you need to know is is the reality. There's a... There's a show that used to be on, it may still be on, on MTV called The Real World. Any of y'all watch Real World? Kaleo students? We got Kaleo students with us this summer, just came in today. We had some in the first service and more. We welcome you back to Village. But Real World, I'll admit it, I've watched it. You know, it's kind of crazy. But here's the real reality about the real world and the real life that Christ offers to us. He said, I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Now, the real world would say an abundant life is being able to party. 
Uh, the real world show would say the, 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 real, the, the, the real life is about being able to do whatever you want to do, whatever makes you feel good, as long as it doesn't hurt somebody else, you know, whatever floats your boat. But the real life that Jesus Christ talks about is a life that is an abundant life. It means that we have a Lord that we follow, and He promises us a continuous victory. And, and it's, 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 more than a, it's more than a philosophy, and it's more than a theology. It's a person, and it's about a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and with the Father, and with the Spirit. And the real reality is, is when Satan's attack comes... Just remember your history. Jesus said, I've ca- I came that they might have life. And what's your history? What's this that you know? He came. Jesus, the Bible says, was rich. And He became poor that He might make us rich. Jesus came. He was born of a, bir- of a virgin in Bethlehem. That was His incarnation. He walked among men that that he might identify with us. That was his life. His death happened on a cruel cross. It was called his crucifixion. Many that saw it that day had given up. They thought it was all over. But hang on. Sunday's coming. And on Sunday morning, the stone is rolled away. And the grave is empty. The stone was never rolled away to let Jesus out. The, stone, the grave couldn't contain him. The stone was rolled away to let us in to see that he wasn't there. And when I look back and I remember that history and I remember that reality, I also remember these words that Jesus spoke, I will return. I will come back. And when your life's being attacked, I want you to know this secondly about the reality of that real life. That life is dynamically available. In other words, it's available with power from on high. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, and he declared, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Think about that. Think about that. I will give them eternal life, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Paul wrote, what shall separate us from the love of God? Height, depth, power, principality. And all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Nothing can snatch us out of the hand of God. The enemy may come. Your life may go under attack. You may lose everything that you've got Physically, you may lose your job, you may lose your car, you may lose your home, you may, uh, you may be down to eating beans and rice, and rice and beans. Your health may fade, but the reality is, is God said He will care for you. He said He will love you. And even when your life looks the bleakest and the darkest, His love is still there and nothing can separate you from that love. I've even known Christians who at times have gotten mad at God and said, I don't want you. You know what? I've had all my kids do that along the way. They've gotten mad at me and they're going to run away. They still talk about the times that I got a hold of them after they ran away. I was just showing love. They might run away and go in the empty lot beside the house when they're little. But could they separate my love for them? They thought they were trying to separate it. What do you think you're thinking when you think that you can separate yourself from the love of God in heaven? You can't do it. There's nothing you could do. Jesus says no one will ever pluck them out of my hand. And that's something that you need to understand. You know, that's not talking about Calvinism and Arminianism and all the other isms of theology out there. It's talking about the truth of God's Word, that we are held secure in the hand of Almighty God. Who can go and do that? Satan, even if he could get into heaven, he couldn't do that. We're held securely in the hand of the Master. We're held by Him. And Jesus, uh, John follows that theme up, you know, as he writes. 
his epistle, his, his pastoral epistle. And he says in 1 John 5, 11, And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. So this is the testimony, right? Whoever has the Son of, has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I mean, it's that simple. It's not a matter of begging at an altar. It's not a matter of, of, of uh, having great, good character. It's a matter of having the Son. And when we have the Son, we have life. You know, it was good talking with Justin last night and finding out about different things that going on in that little town where I used to pastor. And the, um, somebody on Facebook from up there that invited me to like a page called Cruising Ball Ground. Cruising Ball Ground? I mean, we had one little strip with rock shops all owned by the same man and a post office and a four-way stop and a flashing light up at the main highway with a golden pantry and a bank and a gas station. Cruising ball ground? Where are you going to cruise at there? What I found out last night is that dude, uh, that cruise guy that does movies, um, Tom. Tom Cruise is filming a movie in ball ground. I can't believe it. That's unbelievable. I mean, this is mountain people. It's different. But there he is. So I, I'm going to have to go look at that page and see what they're doing, how they're talking. But you know, um, the Son. When the Son becomes our Savior, what does He tell us? He gives us abundant life. You know, that abundant life is about bringing a a deadened heart to transforming, radiant, living life. It's about Christ in me, the hope of glory. And then the third thing about life is this. It's got quality. It's got quality. The quality of Christ. Jesus said, I've come, they may have life and have it abundantly. Verse 11 says, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. They give up. You know, the very first quality I see is the quality of appeal. When Jesus said, I came that they might have life, you know, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ was marked by appealing qualities that most of us can only strive for. I mean, how many of you are always pleasant? Oh, and always tell the truth, Lisa. Yeah. How many of us are gentle all to all, at all times? We're making our gentle spirit known to all men? Nobody? Isn't that amazing? But think about Jesus. Was he always filled with goodness and gentleness? The only time that you don't think of him being gentle, but yet he's really being gentle is when he casts those money changers out of the temple. And he spoke truth. Paul wrote these qualities about the spirit-filled life to the Galatians. And he said, but this is the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. Gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Jesus had it all together. He had the total package. He was attractive to children. He was attractive to fishermen. He was attractive to the women of the day. He was attractive to, to the leaders of the day. He was attractive to the Romans. It was a centurion that Jesus described, a, a pagan centurion that Jesus described as having amazing faith who said, you don't have to come to my house to speak the word that my servant will be healed. And... That's a quality about this life. 
that Jesus would instill that life in us. A second quality is it's abundant. Jesus said to have life and to have it abundantly. The New Century Version says, I came to give life, life in all of its fullness. The message said, I came so they can have a real and eternal life, more and better life than they have ever dreamed of. And this new life in Christ is really, it's an awesome life. You know, when, when you first go into basic training, all you military guys remember this, you didn't know Jack. didn't know Jack. I, I remember this piece of advice my brother gave me. He said, now when you get there, they're going to ask for volunteers. Do not raise your voice or lift your hand. You sit there. So I listened to him. Need 12 volunteers. A lot of 50 people, right? Man, all these guys are raising their hand. Picks out 12 of them. You 12 guys are now the latrine queens. That meant they scrubbed the bathrooms. I didn't volunteer. I went through the whole thing. He says, is there anybody here that didn't volunteer? So I reluctantly let my hand go up. I was the house mouse. <laughs> you, what does a house mouse do? Well, the first few days of basic, he said, you've got to wake me up. How do you go and wake up that T.I. that has scared you? Sir, it's time to get up. (laughs) Oh, God, let him be awake when I knock on his door. But, you know, there, there are these qualities. And I forget where I was going with that story. I didn't have that story planted. And, uh, well, oh, I, I get it. You know, and, but I began to learn, and I, I had a deepened capacity for what the house mouse did. Man, that was a smooth job for basic training. When they sent us down for KP duty, we need volunteers. I didn't lift my hand. I learned. I knew. You know, all these guys were washing dishes and all that kind of stuff. I was a salad man. Worst thing I had to do was chop up radishes with a butter knife. But deep in capacity, began to understand certain things, began to grow. And this is what happens in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our capacities deepen. When we first begin the journey, we don't know anything. Probably the most thing, the biggest thing we know is that we're lost sinners and we need to be saved. We know nothing about a spirit-filled life. We know nothing about a capacitated life. We don't understand those kinds of things. But our capacity deepens. You know what God does? He doesn't leave us empty. The Son of God continues to fill that capacity with the knowledge of Him and all of His fullness. As a matter of fact, Paul talked about the fullness of Christ. In Colossians, he said, For in Him alone dwells the fullness of deity. And in Him we're full. In Him we are complete. In Him we're being extended. In Him we're about growing in perfection. In Him we're about growing in Christian character. In Him we're about becoming fully mature disciples of Jesus Christ. But yet in the process, as Helen Lamel put it, O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light at the end of the way. There's a light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Through death into life everlasting, He passed and we follow Him there. Or us sin no more has dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Oh, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and all the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. And that third quality, is a quality that abides. It lasts. It doesn't end. I came that they might have life. Life that is abundant. Life that is eternal. Jesus said in John 17, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. 
Do you realize that man before the fall knew God? Better than we do? Until sin entered the picture? And ever since, we've been striving to get to know God again. Jesus Christ came that we might know Him and that we might make Him known. And this abiding life is an eternal life, not just for here, for making Him known, but for all of eternity as it continues in heaven. It's a glorious gift for all that will receive it. And the only source, the only place to go for that is to Jesus Christ. Who declared, I have come that they might have life and have that life abundantly. God wants you to be alive in Him. Because it's when you are alive in Him that life becomes abundant. And today, if you've never come to that place where you've opened up your life and said, God, I've kind of made a mess, and I've never trusted in you, and you feel that spark of the Spirit of God just kind of telling you, you need to trust Christ. That's God's Spirit. You need to trust Christ. And I invite you to come. I'll have a prayer here in a second. And invite you to come, and I'll pray with you, and we've got people to counsel with you and give you a few things to get you on your way. Some of you are believers. You've never been baptized. You know, that's the second step of obedience. First step is to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord. Second step is to take the step of baptism, public identification. I mean, you've never been baptized. When Jesus was baptized, the Bible says he was taken down into the water and brought up out of the water. We're baptized in the water. We're baptized in the likeness of his death. We're raised in the likeness of his resurrection. We're fully identifying before the body of Christ that we too are followers of Jesus. Some of you need to make commitment on church membership. You're like a lobby lizard. You know what a lobby lizard is? You sneak in and sneak out. Think you go unnoticed. But I'm kind of like our cat, Bella. I see you. Our cat, you know, she always brings up a lizard every day to the front door. And I'm thinking, Bella, quit bringing the lizard to the front door. You know, I'm tired of scooping it up. And I scoop it up because it might have salmonella, and I don't want to get that on my finger, right? But you need to make that commitment. Memorial Day weekend. It's the time when men and women have made the ultimate commitment for our freedom. We remember the ultimate commitment Jesus made for our spiritual life and our spiritual freedom. What kind of commitment are we going to walk with before the Lord today? Earlier this morning in our prayer time in the prayer room, it was prayed that God would touch this congregation with his spirit and there would be many multitudes in the valley of decision well here you are you're the multitude at this hour and you're in the valley of a decision what are you going to do with Jesus what are you going to do with Jesus let's pray Father, thank you for this morning that you've given to us, and thank you for the word of abundant life in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for all of us today as we find ourselves in that valley of decision. Lord, help us to decide the right things about Christ Jesus in our lives. Lord, as we come to turning our eyes upon you, looking into your face, We pray, O God, that you'll be honored in our lives. Lord, we confess our weaknesses and our frailties and our sin. And we look to you as the source of our life and the strength for daily living. To you be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing this song.